Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Creation Myths. We have a super fun show for you this evening. So this is, well, first, before we get into what we're doing, let me introduce my guest, Erica Gutsik-Gibbon. Erica, welcome back to the show. How are you? Dan, I'm always glad to be here, you know, especially for an occasion like today. I've been looking forward to this all week long. <laughs> I, I've been looking forward to this since the topic of our conversation appeared on the internet mm -hmm. late last week sometime, and it just as soon as it was there, just a field day digging into it. So what we're doing today, everybody, is there's a little bit of a backstory here. So a couple months back, it was back in May, I think it was, um, on the, the Is Genesis History YouTube channel, they posted an excerpt of, I think, Is Genesis History Part 2, and it was a, yes. a short interview with Rob Carter. And the title was something, it's all linked in the description here, by the way, so you can you can all see it down there. Um, but it was a short video on, uh, it was theoretically about molecular clocks, but they touched on a lot of stuff. They touched on molecular clocks, genetic entropy, the awful Jeffrey Tompkins uh, human chimp comparisons, a whole bunch of things that they that they talked about. All about name dropping, by the way. Uh, lest we forget that none right. of Carter's uh, cribbings were actually you know, attributed to anyone in particular. God forbid right. we track them down. <laughs> that is true. It was, it was we're going to talk about genetic entropy, but we're not going to name it. We're going to talk about these 85% human chimp identity, but we're not going to attribute it. We're just going to name, we're going to hit the arguments, but we're not going to like actually talk about the arguments. So we both happened to be actually in the chat of the premiere at the time and just had a field day, just enjoying mm. the heck out of this thing. And so we have a to do, coincidence. right? so we just, we just have to do a video on this. So we did and really went to town on it because um, there was a lot to talk about. So we really hit a lot of the, the high marks, like to the point where I have a creation myth video on most of the things Carter mentioned in that video. And Erica has done deep dives on a bunch of it. So like these are, you know, these are not new things. These were well, well trodden pathways, right? It, it really, it really was a, a, a greatest hits. Now, a, a, that's what I call creationism. <laughs> It was all of the best ones, just slap and go in very, very quick succession. And Dan and I, could, we simply could not let it slide. So we, we had to take each one as it came, which is how we turned an eight or so minute video into an hour and a half. Yeah. Uh, but someone's got to do it. You know, if, if Carter's not going to get into it, then, then we may as well. And, yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Carter. Dr. Carter. So, so that was back in May. And then we're like, okay, that was fun. That's the end. Turns out. That was not the end because last, I think it was last, like last Friday or something, uh, this article appears on CMI and I titled our video. It was uh, Dr. Rob Carter gets everything wrong was the name of our video. So then to my wonder, <laughs> last week on CMI, we get Robert Carter gets everything wrong, responding to even more ridiculous aspersions is the name of the article. So what we are, and they name check me, they name check. Erica, and by that, it's Carter. It's Rob Carter responding to our video. Um, Dapper joined us for part of that video, so he got a name check, and it was really funny what happened with that, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, Dr. Joshua Swamidas got a name check in here, even though it was completely irrelevant to everything we were talking about, but for some reason, Carter felt like going off on him for a few pages. Um, so we're going to go through this article. I'm going to pull it up right here because I saved it as a PDF. And we're just going to go through this top to bottom. And a couple things I want people to notice before we like actually get into it is that if you go back and look at our video, there was a lot of like substance to our video. We hit a lot of creationist arguments like in very specific, like here is why this is wrong. Right, like for time to most recent common ancestor, they used the wrong calculation for mutation accumulation over time. The rate is way too fast, so you get a, a date that's way too close to the present. Right, like there's like we explained why their arguments were wrong. We had a heck of a good time doing it, but like that's what we did. Now, if you read it's this article, it's it's doing your due diligence. If you're going to be it, taking someone else's argument apart, it's it's good practice to actually take it at face value. And dissect the reasons why it's incorrect rather than just, you know, um, proposing your alternative. It has to be like, here's why you're wrong and here's the superior alternative. That's how the scientific method works. So what 
you'll notice as we go through this that that's not what we get here. This is um, apparently we were we were very mean. The phrase that I've seen uh, is mock fest. And I've seen that that like a memo went out to use that phrase because that was uh, I answered I made a comment on like the CMI Facebook where they posted this and I got like mock fest like right back in my face. So like they got the memo. That's the phrase to describe what we did was a mock to be fest. Clear, Dan and I are the meanest evolutionists on the entire web. I mean that that's what both of us are known for. That's why both of us have had so many creationist guests from varying calibers on our channel who have had excellent times from, from Michael Behe onward uh, because we're, we're mean and rude we're and mean. nasty. And yeah, we like, we like pushing the ad homonyms and, and all that stuff like that. <laughs> Call them names. Don't actually engage with yeah. the arguments. That's what we do. That's yeah, what we do. That's, right. It's a mock yeah. fest. Yeah. That's, that's yeah, the whole fest. nature of this channel. Now, now mind you, the, the specific mockeries are not covered in the article. As much as I would love to know where Dan and I went horribly, disastrous, disastrously wrong, it, it's simply not here. Uh, so I can only, you know, I can only kind of uh, use my imagination yeah. to, to work with what was specifically so mock worthy. Yeah, it's just, so we're gonna go through this. Keep an eye out for where there is substance and where there is these people were mean to us. And when Dr. Carter mentions an argument, see how and even if he actually addresses that argument. So we're going to follow along. I have the article open right here. In fact, what I'll do is I'll make it even bigger for us. We can blow it up, make it nice and big so everybody can read. And uh, it starts with this letter from Julie M. And basically saying, uh, <laughs> having a debate, <laughs> linked to me this video called Robert Carter Gets Everything Wrong, <laughs> uh, which that was the one that's, that, that was us. There we go. So saying, okay, can you, can you, you know, help me out here? What's going on with this video? Okay. So, so let's go down to, here we go. Okay. Uh, that's me. Yep. Rutgers University. Uh, Erica, congratulations, by the way, for people that haven't heard master's degree. Way Thank you. Yes. I, I was telling my fiance, actually, when this, when this article came out, I was like, I am so tickled that the first organization <laughs> outside my university to call me a primatologist officially is is cmi so CMI. thank you rob thank you CMI. <laughs> it is it is my utmost pleasure to be engaging with you as a primatologist now so uh, just delighted i have to say yeah. so they he mentioned some some stuff here uh past past back and forth uh you know responding to reputations of genetic entropy i was mentioned in that one um because i'm an expert not a real expert, just an expert. I did a whole video on that. We don't have to spend time on it here. Um, uh, comments on another article, blah, 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 blah. Here's here's where the fun starts, okay? Because remember, we were mean, we did ad homs, we didn't address the arguments, okay? So just keep that in mind when you read, we found that he is not one that accepts correction, will continue to spout off claims after they have been refuted. Well, real quick, Dan. This is a creationist classic, in my opinion. Now, I, I've perhaps not been dealing with creationists quite as long as Dan has, but, you know, three, four odd years. And the, the resounding theme... Yeah, it's like, is, it's like 15 for me. I've been doing this a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah, you can go and wonder that. <laughs> right, right. But, but tell me if I'm hitting the mark here, because this is my, my, meager, my meager fifth of your experience has, you know, has shown me this. It's, you know, creationists will make claim A, you know, about the scientific paradigm. And then you as a scientist will, will come up and say, it's interesting that you make claim B, but here are the problems for claim A. Here are the problems with claim A. You know, it's one, two, three, four, five. They will take that, that statement, that rebuttal, put it into a video or an article or whatever and say, hey, this evolutionist thought they could rebut us, but claim A. And you're like, what about one, two, three, four, five, six? What about the points? What about the criticisms? You know, proper peer review, the way that this works, and, and Dan knows this, and unfortunately I have a little meager experience with this as well, is when you submit a manuscript, you get feedback to it that deconstructs your arguments. It is your job as the scientist to take those deconstructions and fix them or respond to them or cover them in some way. You don't resubmit the manuscript simply reasserting the original points. To do that would get a rejection, which is why, out of all of the publications that are mentioned in this article that are relevant, all of them are from either a creationist source or an ID source. And I know because I tracked them down. So let us continue. Is, is, is RJ here? Source methods. Yeah, RJ, you'll you'll find this one to be a real treat. If, if so, RJ Downard, 
friend of ours, if he's here, it's his thing to just track down every creationist publication and track the evolutionary history, if you will, of the arguments going back to like the 1950s. Um, I really, I guess the 60s, I guess it starts with the Genesis flood and kind of goes from there. Uh, it should be using Morris. this one, by the way, just for those who are keeping, you know, tracking along at home. It's World Scientific that we're going to hit here as an ID source, as well as Biocomplexity, as well as the oh, International Journal CMI. Good old, well. old Biocomplexity. Yeah. We love Biocomplexity. We love it. All right. So, for example, he continues to claim the changes in the H1N1 virus are due to reassortment among different influenza viruses, not genetic entropy, even though we explain the lack of reassortment in the first article above. I read that article. What they did is they showed an alignment from 1918 into the 1950s and showed, aha, no reassortment. They're right. That's a continuous vertical lineage. My problem is they use the 2009 pandemic strain as a reference mm -hmm. sequence to document their mutations in the 1918 to 2009 timeframe. The 2009 pandemic strain of H1N1 was highly reassorted from four, count them four sources, uh, one was swine flu, one was avian flu, one was uh, Eurasian avian-like swine flu, and one was the previous year's, I think it was H3N2 human infecting flu. So you have four sources. And if you just follow the human one of those eight genome segments, only one ended up in the reassorted virus. And that human flu that contributed to the 2009 H1N1 was not a descendant of the 1918 H1N1. It's a different, you can't do like your math that way. And they refuted it by showing a an alignment that was not in the time frame that I was criticizing. It was different things. So they, they didn't refute that. Well, and that's the name uh, of the game, isn't it, Dan? It's it's taking something that to a layman seems equivalent and shoehorning it into to a category that it cannot be involved in by the nature of the field it belongs to, right? You can't do that. And this, by the way, is precisely why so few professionals even take their spare time to look at at creationism's claims because it's so bold in its in its uh, miscalculations and its errors and its usage. Like, Anyone can see that. And and you did a video with Walker where Walker noted and Walker's an undergrad at this time period or at this point in time. And, and he was like, the reason I can sit here and do this is because you don't need that much of an education to see where it goes wrong. That video that Walker and I did, Carter actually mentions the article we were responding to in here. So I kind of hope that he notices that we did a video to it and then Walker can get a CMI article. <laughs> let's let's hope so. Although I, I am I am thinking that we'll probably see a Walker reference once Walker gets his degree because we did that video in May and we didn't get an article until I had my degree. Right. Because so they so, be, they yeah. so uh, uh, desperately, if you will, want to have people with credentials who are who they're going toe to toe with because it lends the idea that the argument is legitimate that the argument deserves attention no if, it doesn't Dan if doesn't that was like, the case they'd be I, publishing it for real and not on cmi's blog and and not on id friendly journals your your yeah. work should be able to stand on its own it shouldn't need to stay in these safe zones ironically these are the people who yeah. <laughs> are so yeah, so snowflake phobic, you know? <laughs> uh, all right. So I like, I love this line. This means he's either not reading our responses. What do you think, y'all? Am I not reading the responses? That's classic, what you, Dan. What do you think? I got Dodgeball so Dan at it I have, again. <laughs> I have so many. I have so many. Tell me. Tell me how I'm not reading any of the creationist literature. Tell me about it, he right? One thing that's incredible that will pop up later in this article is a, a very uh, vague accusation that Dan didn't read Sanford's genetic entropy right, which I oh, was so there. tickled by because Dan was giving us a play-by-play -play as he's going through this entire book, um, both here on YouTube, but more specifically on, on Twitter and, and in personal correspondence, which is, I mean, what do you even do with that? <laughs> I, got, I've, I have so many screenshots of that book of like, can you believe he actually said this? Yeah. So, so I'm either not, I'm either not reading it. Uh, I'm deliberately ignoring it. What do you think? Am I deliberately ignoring it? Or do I not understand it? Chad, okay, you well, us. One, right, two, one, two, threes, you know, let us know in the side yeah. chat what you think. What's the okay, So, so here's some, here's some fun, irrelevant stuff going on right here. I love this. Um, 
I'm an associate of Dr. Joshua Swamidas, who is also a troubler of the creation world. Um, I, I don't even know what to make of this because it's so irrelevant. It's just straight up poisoning the well, right? Like, here's a boogeyman, and Dan has talked to him. Like, okay. Like, yes, uh, Dr. Swamidas and I have interacted on the Peaceful Science Forum. I recommend everyone check out that forum. It's a great place to talk science. Highly recommended. Really good place. A lot of experts actually in various fields in there. Really cool. If that makes me an associate, I wouldn't mind being an associate of Dr. Swamidas. That sounds awesome. But this is just straight up poisoning the well. And also it misrepresents the editorial that Dr. Swamidas did in the Wall Street Journal, where he said, yes, we should label these creationist courses so everyone knows they're creationist courses. The alternative to that was losing accreditation for those schools, right? So his proposal was saying, no, keep it, but just let everyone know what's up. So his was actually the proposal that favored the creationists. Josh right? is, Joshua is your friend here, Robert Carter. I mean, this is he's your friend here. I wouldn't upset him if I were you. Yeah. So then we get to Erica's paragraph. So Erica, you've been making the rounds lately. Oh, I know. <laughs> Like like some like some kind of mist wraith, you know, <laughs> coming uh -huh. put the deep foot on your door because I'm making the rounds, you know. That's by the way, mi mist wraith. That's a that's a that's a Brandon Sandersonism. If you're not reading uh, any Cosmere, that's Mistborn, Stormlight Archive, and the associated books, you also get, get in it. on that great get series. So yeah, right. You're like a a, a a spectral apparition that comes in the night and messes with creationists. So, yeah. so, okay, so uh, you have a mocking attitude. Um, counterproductive is all again. Well, here's, here's, when creationists resort to such tactics, I tend to call them out. Keep that in your back pocket, everybody. We're going to come back put to a, that. There's, put a there's pin another in, line, too. Yeah, just, put just, a pin in, in you know, Christ-like attitude, not wanting to be rude to others. Mm -hmm. just, just, <laughs> put a, a bookmark on it, you know? Just, just, Keep that one, keep that one handy, right? Um, oh, here we go, mock fest. There it is. It's a mock fest. Told you. Mock fest. Mock fest. Okay. Um, would uh, turn so the mock fest would turn my stomach even if someone I disagree with was the subject of your ridicule. I, I like that. Are we revolting, Dan? Is that I, really it? I think we're, I, I mean, I mean, what can I say? So, so I, I'd like to give a, you know, a, a very quick aside on this is that those of you who know Dan and I on YouTube, like it's, it's really been the mission of both of us to actually, you know, instigate a dialogue. Both of us want to have these conversations. I've done countless fun discussions on modern day debate. Dan has creationist young earth and idea like come on his channel to discuss their ideas, to just do a back and forth uh, and, and to take it as it is creationism as it is and the claims that it makes. And that's because both Dan and I here and years ago on Debate Evolution, we the subreddit, um, which you should go visit, by the way. You should check that subreddit out. Also we, fun. Yeah, we want to have this discussion. One, because it's enjoyable and fun to to you know kind of go back and forth and have have kind of a, a, a back and you know dialogue rather on on the subject, but also because as people who who really do enjoy conventional science and I can't speak for Dan here, but I think that's the best way to educate. I think that when people see uh, alternative views being put forward and the reasons as to why they don't hold water, it can really give the the audience who's taking that in uh, an appreciation from where both people are coming from and which ideas stand on their own. And, and I don't say that to be vitriolic or mean or, or mocking, you know, God forbid. It's not like mocking is, is a part of peer review. It, like I've heard worse things on, on research proposals than what so you and bad. I said. Uh, but I digress. You know, that's the idea, right? Is to have this discussion and see what withstands the test. Not like evolutionary theory needs Dan and I's help. It's been around for, you know, a century and a half and has done Doing just fine. fine with standing scrutiny without us. But it's enjoyable and, and it allows people to get a kind of grassroots feel for the conversation. Yeah. No, on, on the note of the, the, you know, evolutionary theory as a field, not needing our help. It's, it's one thing that often gets lost in this conversation is the degree to which most working biologists have no idea that this is happening. They're just that like, is... ask anybody, Hey, what do you think of the latest out of discovery Institute? And they go, who? I, I like, can't, I can't agree with you enough. That's that's something that I bring up on my channel a lot because I, I feel very similarly. And it didn't even occur to me. Thank like, you, Ian. Ian. 
Thank you, Ian. It didn't even occur to me until I started getting my master's degree and I actually got to talk to people who are actively out in the field doing doing research and doing work. And, and the answer when I spoke to one of my um, one of my professors at, at Roehampton, when I said that this is what I do in some of my free time, he said, the creationists are still around. And he kind of said it with this hint of whimsy. In his <laughs> I still, I because remember I remember that. I remember going to their conventions and chatting them with them outside. I would have thought that they would have kind of come around by now, but I guess not. Uh, and then he said something, you know, along the lines of, well, Flat Earth is still kicking around, so who knows? And I, I was, I found that to be very funny. Of course, this would come across as mocking, <laughs> Dan. We're mocking uh, even you know, we're mocking. We're mocking. The mocking. Right. Um, so I want to, I want to jump to the end of this paragraph because he goes on and says how we're meanies and, you know, we're like, you know, Huxley and Dawkins um, I'm not saying the presenters are like this, but only a step or two away. We're only a step or two away from being really big meanies. But here's what I want to highlight. Another note, this also means we must watch the attitude displayed by our side. And it's right now that I want to pause in our, our trudge through this, this, this thicket of words. I want to scroll down to the comments. I want to scroll all the way to the comments, to the first comment that was made on this article when it was posted. The channel Standing for Truth makes many videos refuting Gibbon, Aaron Ra, and probably Dan. Their videos are very good. Greetings. Rob Carter. Yes, they are friends of CMI. I have been on their show, as has my office mate. Even better, they did a great job answering blah, 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 blah. So I don't know if any of the people watching are familiar with the Standing for Truth consortium, um, but I feel yeah. like they might rub, rub Dr. Carter the wrong way here, given how he took such offense at our mock fest. Erica, Carter, what do you think? Dr. Carter, if I may be so blunt, I don't think you know these individuals quite as well as you think you do, if you think the attitude that Dan and I have presented here is, is inappropriate and a mock fest uh, when compared to some of our, our compatriots over at the Standing for Truth YouTube channel conglomerate. So Dan, if you would share your screen with me, I hope this will come up. It's, it's in my pictures, so ideally this will show. I think it yeah, should. Yeah, so you should pull yours up. And I will say on what you just said in terms of being familiar with it, when Dr. Carter first appeared on SFT, I actually sent him an email out of courtesy out of professional courtesy, because I didn't know, I'd never interacted with Carter before that point. I didn't know him. I just knew he was a professional, right? So I actually said, hey, just so you know, professional to professional, the channel you're appearing on, they like to kind of harass people. And I sent him a couple of screenshots. One of them was, I think, the one you're going to show where he, he employs some threats uh, saying that uh, he could beat somebody up. And then another one was actually a comment directed at you uh, that was very sexist in nature, and SFT gave it the little heart in his comment thread. Yeah. So, so I actually emailed Dr. Carter, and this caused a hubbub a few months back when Standing thought I was like trying to get him canceled. And it was like, no, this was literally professional to professional, knowing that like you got to watch out who you associate with, right? And, you know, employers can get mad if, like, you stick your neck out too far. So, like, I was just saying, hey, Dr. Carter, just so you know, they, you know, they kind of go off sometimes, just so you know when you decide if you want to appear on their channel. He said, thanks for the info. I wish everybody could be perfect. That was his response. And I'll tell you, when you show the ones that I showed him, I will tell you. So, with that, let's add what you have to the stream. That's one of the ones I sent him. Yeah, can you, can you, if everyone can see this, this says uh, to to a, a friend of both Dan and myself, to Atheist Jr. Um, He's here. Or, He's or, in the chat, by the way. Hi. Atheist Jr., hello. Hope you're doing well. Doing an excellent series on uh, our friend, Mr. Kent Hovind, right now, I will say. Uh, yeah, Mr. So Kent. Everyone should check out everyone should check out his channel, just aside. Back to you, Eric. Dinosaur Adventure Land, the one and only. Um, I, I, I like this one quite a bit because after calling Atheist Jr. a big whiny baby who needs to grow hair on his legs, uh, proposing that he's wrestled and has done boxing and judo for years, uh, he asserts that, that Atheist Jr. is indeed, and these are not my words, I would never be so crass, a pussy ass bitch when I see one. So that's great. Calls him a weirdo, insinuates that there's there's some kind of, I suppose, like a stalking uh, accent to all of that. Uh, and uh, another user of the of the Stand for Truth channel, Monkey for Banana channel, is uh, one Raw Matt, 
who proposes uh, that he could in fact break Dan in half on a bad day, which is funny to me <laughs> because I don't recall any threats ever being made on quote unquote our side. Dan and I, again, are only, and this is, we have the receipts for all of this and I'm sure they oh, do as well. So many screenshots. Yeah, by, by all means, anyone can put anything forward here, but I am not interested in making threats at people. I think that it's unprofessional at best and uh, borderline criminal at worst. So let's just allow that one to hang in the air <laughs> for a moment because these are the individuals who, who Rob, uh, Dr. Carter is associating with after calling Dan and I's coverage and critique strictly of his arguments, a mock fest. So. And specifically saying that if, even if the people doing this were on his side, it would make him, what was the phrase? It would, uh, it would turn his stomach, right? I'll also note on our friend, Dr. Raw Matthew, uh, the, the, I'll just direct everyone to Dapper Dino's channel for the saga of the fraudulent publication. Uh, and also uh, you can check out one of my videos to find the time when he doctored video to make it look like I was lying about reading book. And he yeah. spliced conversation together to make it look like I was lying about it when I in fact wasn't, which was clear if you watched the unedited video. So that's that's the kind of people well, that were, were happy and, to associate with. The and friends. Dan, and I, Dan and I wouldn't bring this up. We didn't bring any of this up in the original video because it didn't matter. It was about addressing the arguments. But if Dr. Carter but, feels the need to call it a mock fest and to call what Dan and I did uh, to insinuate that it's highly inappropriate, the, the, the measures by which we uh, critiqued on the on the note that he would never associate with such people who would be so unprofessional, then I feel the need to tell you, Dr. Carter, you shouldn't throw stones in glass houses. Yep. And we're leaving out a lot. We could just spend a whole stream just going through screenshots that we've collected of Raw Matt and his new channel name, Young Earth Creation, and Standing for Truth, and the other uh, the, the other um, intellectuals stuff. on their various channels. Uh, for example, making standalone streams, cursing out me, our friend Dapper Dinosaur, uh, just like going to town on people for no reason. Oh, the, oh, let us not forget the homophobic and transphobic thumbnails for their videos. Uh, right? Don't forget the sexist. Though, a the lot of just, one. You're right. There's the garden variety sexism too, where <laughs> Erica <laughs> was said, where in, in our little, you know, team dodgeball that we have, uh, someone said that Erica uh, could only be the cheerleader, couldn't actually be a member of team dodgeball. It is 2021 people. And these are the kinds of things we're getting. These well, are the people that Dr. Carter says are friends. While, and while we're, happy while we're to on that, let's not forget the back to the future style font that had a picture of me with a ladle and like a chef's hat. And it's like back to the kitchen. Awesome. Yeah. Really yeah. good stuff. I'm really sure you cool. would have heard of really, appreciate that. Really good stuff here, but you know, but we turn his stomach. So again, people, we are going to get to the substance here, but this is too rich and we are going to harp on the hypocrisy a bit because and like, it's yeah. necessary. It's necessary to touch on because Dan and I took the time to dissect each individual argument last time. And clearly CMI, at least in this article is not interested in addressing the meat of the article. Yeah. So Dan and I may as well take 30 minutes to discuss the hypocrisy that is evident. Yeah. So let us continue to this line, which is edited. This was uh, not the original one, uh, this line. Oh, why can't I? There we go, here we go. So this line was actually uh, edited a little bit because this line originally had a name in it. Uh, Dr. Carter actually doxed Dapper Dino who appeared with us kind of for the tail end of our, of our mock fest and mm -hmm. which we're just gonna call that for that. It's the mock fest. So he, he joined us for the tail end of the mock fest and Dr. Carter uh, confused him with the other Dapper Dinosaur on YouTube and accidentally doxed that guy who I think his name is public. So it's like not that big a deal but the fact that he intended to dox the Dapper Dino that we are friends with, who has a persona and is clearly anonymous on YouTube, that is not cool, that is not acceptable. It's, you don't get bonus points because you screwed up the doxing, okay? You still tried to do it. That's not, that's not okay, all right? right? Like, come on, Rob, grow up. Okay, 
So now we now we're getting into the meat of it. We're we're you know a couple of pages in. We're we're now into the part they did a video. We got to the they did a video part of this now. Right. We we should put a note. We should put a note in the description of this video that at thirty minutes in we are getting into the actual arguments. Uh, sorry, argument that is made in this article. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Um, they talk about, so they talk about uh, Sanford and Tompkins and how they're outside their field. Here's the thing. They call this, uh, I think it's here or is it somewhere else? It's, it's a, a little bit down below the here. Hypocrisy thing. The here hypocrisy we go. Thing. Right. So here they called an ad hom that we said these people are speaking outside of their fields, right? That's not what we did. We noted that they were speaking outside of their fields. But we did not say, therefore, they are wrong. The ad hominem is irrelevant thing X, therefore, you're wrong. What we did is irrelevant thing X, and also, here's all the reasons you're wrong. That's not an ad hom. That's just noting something and moving on. So at, at 1.2 here, and I, I'm sure that, uh, yeah, strangely, the irony was lost on them. He, he says this due to the fact that Dan and I are allegedly speaking outside of our field. So Dan is an evolutionary biologist, and I'm a primatologist. I, I think the things that we talked <laughs> about were pretty within our collective fields, first of all. Mm -hmm. Second yeah. of all, it's been a policy of mine, and I'm sure Dan's as well, that there is no problem with speaking outside of your field, supposing you cite your sources, and those sources are correct. You can speak outside of your field all you want, as long as you actually get stuff right. At one point, he notes that um, it doesn't take an expert to point out that the emperor has no clothes, something along those lines. Um, but it does in science, usually, nine times, 99.99 .99 times out of 10, the overturner of the paradigm has experience within the paradigm. And this is because in order to overturn a topic, you have to have a level of expertise in it. That's part of why people <laughs> go and get all of these degrees and spend so many years in school. So yes, you can speak about things and not be an expert. Although you're probably not going to be doing any paradigm shifts if you aren't, if history has anything to say about it. In fact, I sat here looking at my notes and thinking to myself, has there ever been a time when the one who overturned the paradigm wasn't educated in the subject, whether it was prions, plate tectonics, the dynamo, anything along those lines? And the answer, is a resounding no. Yep. It's, yep. It's, I, I had the exact same examples in mind, adding to the mix ribozymes. Like mm -hmm. it's, these all came from, you know, biochemists, geologists, people that were immersed in the field going, wait a minute, right? That was, it was people in, in the field that did the work and figured it out and moved science forward, right? So. Right. A quick, quick last note, too, uh, at the top of what you've got showing right now, it says oh, Sanford yeah. has spent the last several decades intensively studying population genetics and has amassed an impressive record of publications. I encourage everyone to go and look at that list of publications. Most of them are creationist sources. In fact, mm -hmm. the, the, the article that that links you to starts with, after the success of the rate project, which is radio <laughs> uh, and, and the history of the earth, I think along those nature, mm -hmm. along that, uh, along those lines, and the Ray Project, for anyone who has perhaps forgotten, set out to show that radiometric dating cannot be consistently accurate because of one reason or another. And at the end, in the Ray Project's own summary, they admit miracles are necessary to, to cause accelerated nuclear decay in the first place, which there is no evidence for. It's a circular reasoning thing. And to get rid of all of the heat that said accelerated nuclear decay would emit. So we're already, by, by, by admission of CMI themselves, you can't be a young earth creationist unless you invoke miracles. It's not scientific. We could close the case right then. But Dan and I just love this so much. So why don't let's, we continue? So let's continue. So continue now, we get, now, we get, now we get into some insinuations that I am dishonest right here because we're going to talk about uh, my history with genetic entropy, the hypothesis, and genetic entropy, the book. So at one point, Stern Cardinal claims that genetic entropy is his favorite wrong creationist argument. Fact check, 100% true. Genetic entropy is my favorite creationist argument. Love everything about it because literally everything about it is wrong. He claims to have read Sanford's book. There claims is. to have read Sanford's book. I have read that book cover to cover twice. I've highlighted it. I've annotated it. I have copious notes on that book. The amount of ink I have spilled 
on genetic entropy, like interspersed with quotes from the book. I just, I don't know what to make of, he claims to have, I mean, this is just straight up poisoning the well, right? There's no reason to state it that way, unless you want to plant the seed that this guy is dishonest. There's no other reason to say that, right? So yeah. like Carter, I'm, I'm trying, I'm going to keep this. We're going to keep this nice. I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to say mean words, but like you can, I'm not going to finish that sentence, but I'm not happy about that insinuation because that's, you know, give me a break. The Calvin and Hobbes censored version would be go soak your head. Um, because it's, right. <laughs> and, and unlike Dan, because I've already been deemed, you know, a, a, a wrong think mock fester who's rude and, and a big fat meanie. So I feel quite comfortable, you know, as putting in a, putting out and espousing my thoughts on this entire article. Uh, I won't be profane either, because Dan and I consider ourselves to be you know, somewhat professionals in in this uh, in this field. But that being said, this is great. Everything up until this point has been poisoning the well. It's all, yeah. you know, and and in my case, it was she's too young to appreciate science as it is. You should be greatly concerned that someone with a master's degree is capable of showing you where you're incorrect as someone who's got a, a PhD. You, you should be concerned about that. Or undergrads or people who, who you know, have not gotten a formal education for that matter, as many, many folks have gone out here and, and digested CMI and been able to very articulately explain why the arguments simply do not work. Yeah. And you know what? I'm going to I'm going to bow to public pressure here um, because, you know what, give the people what they want. Right. So I will tell you, I actually have multiple versions of this book. So I have a I have a clean copy that is uh, a a purchased ebook, And then I also have a marked up all to hell scan that is terrible quality, but it's it's useful to mess up because you could just mark it up and not not mess with the clean text. And that's what I'm going to show you. Um, so this is uh, I have it right here. So this is now let me. Let me, uh, hang on. Oh my gosh, we lost Dan. Well, that's okay. Uh, in the meantime, I would love to express that the, 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 the next point that's going to be made in this, in this article, oh, sorry, man. I was covering for you. My stream, uh, and my screen share, and I clicked out of, I, I so <laughs> let, that was, that was a, that was a good one. Uh, way to go, Dan. All right. Um, so okay. here. Here you go. You know what? You want to see how much I've read this book? Look at this book, okay? Tell me I haven't read this book, okay, everybody? I don't want to hear it. So, you know what? Like, that's 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 the end of that. Thank you. I've read the book. I've highlighted the book. I don't want to hear it anymore. Thank you. So, now... So, and that's a perfect, that's a perfect segue, because what I was saying while you were gone is, is the next thing I have in my notes is the assertion that there is no math in the genetic entropy book, and we shouldn't be complaining about that, because... Richard Dawkins didn't put math in his books. So I'm really sorry, but when your book, Genetic Entropy, is one of the only things being put out there to be digested by the public as this hypothesis, if you don't have your math, we reserve the right to make fun of it for that. You don't get to propose a paradigm shift and yep. not include your math, period. Unless that math can be found somewhere else. And you tell me, Dan, it can the math be found anywhere? No. Okay. You may be shocked to learn it cannot. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. But first, I want to point out that he attempts to refute it by saying this book on population genetics contains no math. That's not true. I don't attempt to refute it by saying there's no math in the book on a field that is fundamentally mathematical. I note that there's no math in the book because it's funny. And I actually got that from Chris, our friend CRISPR, who may or may not be in the chat. He pops in you know, every now and again, you can find him right. on Peaceful Science. I actually got that from him, that it's a it's a book about math with no math in it. But I don't note that to refute the book. I note that because it's funny. And then I refute the book by pointing out all the things wrong with the argument, like fixed fitness effects of mutations, a static distribution of fitness effects rather than context dependency, right. a, a lack of difference in relative fitness within popular, I could go on. We don't need to rehash genetic entropy. I have a number of substantive cr critiques of that hypothesis. That's how I refute it, not by saying there's no math in the book. That's and just what, a funny thing. What kills me about this too, Dan, is in the previous video, the two of us, actually, you, you said it. I was the one being uncharitable. And then you said, let's do a charitable interpretation. He's a molecular geneticist guy. So 
maybe he doesn't right. know very much about pop jack guy. Guy. right and i said okay that's because i rewatched the video while i was running this afternoon and, I, and my response was okay that's a charitable interpretation let's go with that and we both agreed and we were very happy with that and in this article carter spends several sentences asserting that no sanford does in fact know population genetics which makes it so much worse, so much worse. that he's making the mistakes that he's right. made right that should never have seen the light of day dr carter you should not have put that in this article so the next set and i know we're going slow it's already 9 40 and we're like we're to but you know what we're gonna let this breathe we're gonna take our time that's fine we're gonna have fun we're gonna we're gonna let this breathe so next one how much math has Richard Dawkins included in his books? I want to point out, one, depending on the book, quite a lot. You should read The Selfish Gene. Quite a bit of math in there. Two, two, this is this this is a fallacy, and this gets points for difficulty. This is like a twist with a backflip. This is because what this is, this is a, and I'm going to say it wrong, and someone's going to get mad at me because it's Latin. This is a tuquoqua fallacy. I probably said that wrong. I'm sorry, tuquoqua. I'm, whatever it is. So this is a, to quote qua fallacy against a third party is what this is. Why is this here? What relevance is there? I I felt the same thing. When I reached this point of the article, I, I actually scratched my head because I was thinking to myself, why? Why is this in here? First of all, who cares what, what Richard Dawkins has put in his books for laymen? I, I certainly don't. He's done traditional literature where there's plenty of math, but his books are written for laymen. I'm not interested in defending Richard Dawkins because he's going to say what he's going to say. Especially um, if it's on Twitter and it's about trans yeah. people. It's guaranteed to be <laughs> stupid. I was just going to say, some of it's quite problematic. But, like, this is an article that is basically a beef between Rob Carter, Dan, me, Josh Swam, and us <laughs> and So it's like... And Richard, and Richard Dawkins, and Richard don't leave him out. <laughs> You know, somewhere, somewhere, Richard Dawkins is like looking up from his team. He's like, I feel a disturbance, you know. But I mean, if he cared I mean, about it, it, it you know what? You know what it reminded me of? There's a there's a really funny art. This is totally off topic, but it's a really there's a really funny thing that you should look up. It's if World War One was a bar fight, and there's a whole bunch of angry glaring at each right. other, and then the war starts when Germany looks at France and punches Belgium, and that's right. what it is like. Why did you? Why are you going after them? Like what? So, yeah, I don't know what's going on here. This is... God, uh, the last thing I want to say about that is that it's like, why would you point to a scientist that does, like, pop side books as someone who needs to include math in it? I mean, if that's the case, then what's being equated here is something like The Greatest Show on Earth of the Selfish Gene and Genetic Entropy, the or, book. Or <laughs> The Extended Phenotype, which is really? actually technical and has a lot of math in it. Right, and th that's exactly what I was going to say. If you're comparing the greatest show on earth, for example, where there's no math and and something like genetic entropy, fine, except for the glaring fact that the greatest show on earth refers to hundreds of different papers that do have math. Genetic entropy does not refer to anything that mathematically substantiates its core hypothesis, that of genetic entropy or, or degradation of, of the genome. Um, I, I mean, we, we could talk all day on that particular yeah. point, So, honestly. So here's where we get a little bit of substance, but it's not anything that we talked about because he now starts talking about Mendel's accountant. And the interesting thing here is I went back and rewatched our previous screen, and you know how many times we brought up Mendel's accountant? Zero. It didn't come up at all. So now he's saying you're wrong about genetic entropy because Mendel's accountant. Well... I'm not, I didn't talk about Mendel's accountant. I'm talking, and we were talking more broadly, about John Sanford's book, in which he lays out the argument for genetic entropy. And the problems that I pull out are from the text of his book. Now, that being said, there are problems with Mendel's accountant. So, for example, he, claim, he says right here, he claims that all uh, mutations in the model have a fixed fitness effect and are not context dependent. Right? Yes, mm. that is that is true because I'm referring to Sanford's book. Right? You can you can futz with Mendel's account. I actually don't think you can do that in Mendel's accountant. As far as I'm familiar with the code of it, you you I, I don't think you can. You set fitness values at the start and just kind of let it go. And those fitness values don't change as mutations occur, which is a mm. is a fundamental flaw. But I wasn't talking about Mendel's accountant. 
talking about the book, Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. It, it's possible if memory serves, and, and don't quote me on this, I admit that this, I don't know very much about Mendel's account and that accountant, that's Dan's thing. That's why I've never on my channel nor on Dan's ever mentioned or talked about Mendel's accountant. But from what I understand, I, I believe you can set the context, but very similar to the fitness effect, it's constant. It's constant. So that's the next line right here about, right. he says, I was complaining about the frequency of beneficial mutations. No, I don't care what, you can set the frequency to whatever you want. The problem is that once you set that frequency, it mm -hmm. stays constant. And that frequency, it's called the distribution of fitness effects. What of all the mutations that can occur? What are the fitness effects of all those, right? And that distribution in terms of how many negative, how many positive, how many neutral, that distribution changes just by virtue of the fact that mutations are occurring. So you remove a mutation from consideration and you add into the pool the reverse mutation. You have now changed the distribution of fitness effects. So to say, say you set it to you know, 0.99 and 0.01, right, off the bat. You mm. say there's no neutrals, it's 99 to one, harmful to beneficial. Fine, that needs to change as mutations occur and it doesn't. And well, that's and fundamentally the, flawed. You know, Sorry, I, mean, I said, as the context for the environment changes as well. And that's the other side of it. I mean, yep. it, you can't just, you can't just say that this is a constant thing. And what drives me crazy, absolutely bonkers mad is that both in this article and elsewhere on CMI, Answers in Genesis, uh, uh, is Genesis history, Genesis apologetics, whatever. There's this notion that evolutionists, quote unquote, that's just to say conventional scientists, always have to have a constant rate. I can't even express how incorrect that is. That, that's not true for geology. That's not true for biology. There, there is no need to, to um, there's, there's no support for a constant rate like that cannot at all be altered except in the things like physics where, where there are laws of, of physics that cannot and have never been observed to be violated. Otherwise, things like mutation rate they can change. Case in point, the hominid slowdown hypothesis. I mean, this is this is a case where we are directly observing by comparing, just like our our boy Sanford and just like uh, uh, Carter loves to do, pedigrees of great ex. There's an excellent. We'll get there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm I'm getting I'm getting. No, you're good. You're good. Point point is is that mutation rates can change. Things in geology like deposition rates can change. The reason why we generally assume a constant rate is because. It is shown to be constant unless there is something to violate that. Unless there's, there's something to cause it to change. Right. It, there is nothing to my knowledge that is naturally cyclical. There has, or not cyclical, that is naturally random in, in how it moves about, right? It, there's always something to cause it to be that way, whether it's the environment influencing. Uh, or just differences, just differences in stability and different nucleotides sure. affect you. Sure. Know, if you have more cytosine in your genome, you're going to have a higher mutation rate than a than an AT rich genome because cytosine mutates faster. Right. Or or certain influxes of certain minerals can influx uh, or can influence rather the the deposition rates in in certain marine environments. I mean the, these are but but here's the thing, and I'm sure it's very similar in in the case of of genetics. But in geology, what you have to see is the traces of those minerals before you assume that the deposition rate has changed. It's, it's kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like the, the we got the law of gra we got gravity, right? How gravity impacts impacts things that that fall, right? Or or objects on this earth. You wouldn't propose that gravity just stops at seven feet unless you could actually show why it would stop at seven feet. The reason we know where gravity stops impacting the way that it does is because of, of you know, the nature of orbit, right? There is a reason to propose a change there. But we've yet to see a reason to to propose the kinds of changes that creationists assert. I'm sorry. Continue. No, you're great. That was that's great. And the same thing works with biological entities. For example, with like viruses, you can do coalescence analysis looking at viruses in the time to most recent common ancestor. But if there's like a pandemic, when a virus gets into a new host, you often see uh, positive selection, right? You see adaptive evolution as it adapts to that new host. And you can document that by looking at specific types of changes. And you can see an accelerated substitution rate as these beneficial mutations fix in the genome at a rate that is faster than the kind of long-term background rate of fixation. But again, you can document that kind of thing. You mm -hmm. can't just say for no reason that the rates are different here and there and whenever. You have to like have a reason that would cause that to be the case, right? You can have, you right. can document like the generation to generation mutation rate 
And then you can look at the long-term substitution rate. And that substitution rate is going to change based on the ecological mm -hmm. situation, right? And we can document that. It's not a mystery. In these guys' minds, nuance is not allowed. And nuance is what defines, it's what defines whether or not rates are going to be constant or not, whether or not they're going to be these, these uh, external factors. And here's the key, here's the key thing here. The creationists will point to times that rates have changed and they will adopt this and say, look, you see, you know, this mineral can deposit faster or this mutation can, you know, uh, uh, occur faster and thus we can get younger timeframes. There is no, nothing close to a change that will take the magnitude of these long time scales and cram it into 6,000 years. Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, the fact that rates change doesn't mean that they can break physics. <laughs> right, like, exactly. That's just the way that it is, so. So two more points to wrap up this, this Mendel's accountant thing. One, we actually have a question here. It's a good question, is that if you go back up here, uh, published in the secular literature up here, uh, Sanford did actually publish the program, Mendel's accountant, like, Hey, here's here's the thing. He published it in a in a computer science journal. It was a computational thing. It wasn't a biology thing. So it was like, here's the code, blah, blah, here's how it works. And it was essentially computer scientists checking his work on that, right? It was not peer-reviewed in biology literature, in evolution literature, in population genetics. It has not been evaluated through those fields in peer review. So let's be clear about that. The second thing right here, and the last thing before we can jump down a little bit, because there's a figure that doesn't matter, and then we get to Haldane's dilemma. Uh, but right here is he wraps up his criticism with a whopper. I cannot see how he drew the conclusion that there are no differences in relative fitness from one person to the next, no selectable differences in the model population. So this is definitional in genetic entropy, because again, the way John Sanford makes this argument is that you have slightly deleterious mutations that are harmful that are deleterious, they hurt fitness. Now, in order to make this work, he has to redefine fitness. That's the fundamental problem here because if you're if it, you're hurting your fitness, the definition of deleterious to fitness is being selected against, right? That's, that's what the words mean, right? Sanford's argument is that these mutations that will eventually have a cost accumulate, but they are not selected against at all until they hit some threshold and then the population falls off a cliff, right? They have no cost, they have no cost, they have no cost, and then it falls off. Now, in order for that to happen, there can be no differences in relative fitness among the surviving and reproducing individuals of right. each generation. Because if there are differences in relative fitness, then by definition, selection is acting on those slightly deleterious mutations. Like this is not a genetics problem. This is not a disagreement over finer points of population genetics. This is what the words mean. Fitness, right. selection, deleterious. This is just what the words mean. If the mutations are deleterious, then they are selected against. If they are not selected against, there is no difference in relative fitness among the individuals with the mutations, because that's what those words mean. And I want to be very clear about that from everybody. This is just straight up, if you go to the glossary of a textbook, a pop gen textbook, an evolution textbook, you go to the glossary of a textbook. Rob Carter is picking a fight with the glossary of the textbook is what's going on here. This this is stuff that again, like like Darwin and, and subsequent scientists were, were capable of defining and observing. I mean this this is, as Dan said, it's definitional, which is to say you're not learning about this in undergrad biology, you're learning about this in high school. Um, and and for May, I'll give them I'll give them like undergrad bio with this one. I'll give them undergrad bio with like relative fitness. I'll give them undergrad bio. I'll spot them that. Okay, but some people <laughs> bio. I took it. It was difficult, and we did learn this stuff there. So you know, I mean, but I guess that I guess that is. And this is me like flexing. I'm using my high school career to flex, but <laughs> I love it. I, I, I want right. to know while while we're on the subject of of Dr. Carter, sort of messing up definitions. He links to an article here that you and Walker, who's in the who's in the comments right now, actually covered the out of Africa um, reasons why uh, African population oh, here it is. Have greater genetic diversity. There it is. Yep, there it is right there. Yeah. So we'll get to the out of Africa stuff, and we we did a video on that one too. Sure right, did. and there and there are, and we'll talk about it when we get there. But there are like three problems. different very basic no no not problems three different very basic definitions that yeah. goofs up in that 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 Dr. Carter goofs up. I don't understand why that is happening. 
excuse me. Yeah, it sounded like I was like crying. I'm crying because the science is so bad, but I was actually just taking my own water. So. <laughs> okay. So now he, he gives us a whole bunch. He gives us a paragraph basically of like, they said this, that's wrong. They said this, that's wrong. They said this, that's wrong. But he doesn't like attempt to refute any of it. So like going through here, um, we, you know, evolutionary model strength of predictions. Yes, we have accurate predictions. Yes, we do. Um, uh, you know, yeah, the creation model underdeveloped. Thanks. All right, high diversity within Africa, longer sections of inherited DNA, which is to say um, linkage disequilibrium uh, outside. That's what he's saying. He's saying he's talking about linkage disequilibrium here. And the the analogy for this is take a deck of cards, right? Two decks of cards or one deck, take one deck of cards, right? And it comes out of the box and it's all in order, right? So the two is next to the three and all the hearts are together and all the diamonds are together, right? That is at disequilibrium, right? Things are stuck next to each other. And then you take, you shuffle it up real good. And then after however many shuffles, the two is just as likely to be next to a king as it is to be next to a three, right? So that's at equilibrium. And because there's more, because we started in Africa, radiated outwards, you have founder events where you lose genetic diversity and you lock in bigger linkage blocks. So you have more disequilibrium in the genome outside of Africa. Erica, you're the human evolution person. How did I do with that? You did well. Yeah, I mean, that's that's effectively it. And, and Carter, interestingly enough, covers the very basics of that in, in the linked article that he provides. He just gets it wrong. Just gets it totally wrong, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't understand. The, the prime example are, are inferring these small populations that are exposed to high amounts of inbreeding are somehow increasing the genetic diversity of, of like Africa as a continent. And and I don't understand how exactly oh, that, that is one. going about. How, how is wanna, that reasoned? I just want to second this. I want to see the article on the, on, uh, featuring uh, Walker. I think that would be great. Let's get just walking really, fish and see really, really well done. I, I mean, <laughs> listen, I, Walker knows the, the human evolution genetic stuff better than I do. That's for sure. Uh, I'm much more on the, the paleontological and extant primatology side, but I mean, shoot. So, so then we get down to um, Haldane's, Haldane's dilemma, which like, no, that, not a problem. That was, I looked it up. That was 1957, if I recall the year correctly, that was proposed. And it's it's solved. Um, neutral theory, recombination. Haldane's dilemma is that you can't select for multiple things uh, efficiently enough. So in order to select for, uh, in order to have many different sites that have been selected for within a population, basically you need to kill a prohibitive number of the individuals in the population and it's not sustainable because you have to select out, which is evolution speak for kill without reproducing, right? Mm. So Haldane's dilemma uh, it was from before we realized how much the genome is actually under neutral uh, evolution rather than strong selection, right? It's not constrained. So you can have, you know, you don't need to have selection operating on very much of the genome, right? It's like, in terms of sequence specificity, it's well under 5% of the human genome. And in terms of functionality more broadly, I mean, maybe you could get it up to like 15, maybe on the outside, wildest dreams, 20%. Like you're not getting above that. It's just not there, the functions. So neutral theory gets you around Haldane's dilemma. Recombination gets you around Haldane's dilemma because if you can take two beneficial alleles and recombine them together, now you can select for them as a unit. That gets you around the problem. So like that, and I want to be very clear about this for people who are not familiar with the underlying pop gen and evolution here. Haldane's dilemma was never a problem. It was never a dilemma when he proposed it. Creationists have run with that. But he was pointing it out because he was saying, hey, if my math is right, everyone would be dead. All large vertebrates would mm -hmm. be dead because our populations are too small to sustain the level of genetic variation that we observe if you need to select for all of these different things. The solution being, you don't need to select for all those different things and you're sexual so you can recombine things, right? Like this was never, a it was obviously wrong. For, like it was a, you know, it's like Muller's ratchet. Like it's not a real problem. It's a, it's a conceptual idea. And then you seek to explain what solves it, right? And that's how you like advance the field. And like to pretend, like the nerve it takes to pretend that this is actually like a live issue is astonishing. It yeah, hasn't imagine, been in 40 years. Imagine if other fields operated this way, like at the dawn of time, you know, two cavemen are sitting around and they're like, oh, I can't figure out two plus two, you know? And then like a couple of days later, one's like, oh, I 
hey man, you know, like I think it's four. And then the first one's like, hmm, that sounds ad hoc to me. Just because you solved the problem doesn't mean the problem is solved. But, I mean, I, I don't, the, the, the fact that Haldane proposed this idea, as Dan said, this concept is what spurred neutral theory because there was this open question. What is it that science seeks to do to answer questions? So when you have a question that does indeed fill in the proposed problem, if you will, that's science acting as it should. You don't get to call answers to questions rescuing devices. I'm really yeah. sorry. That's not how this works. It's, it, the COVID vaccine is actually just a rescuing device, by the way, in case anyone's wondering. Rescuing device. Get yourselves vaccinated, people. Yeah, get vaccinated, the, everybody. The vaccines, safe, effective, and importantly, effective against the Delta variant. So get you your vaccines. You can go to almost specialist. any... You can go to almost any pharmacy in the in the United. If you're in the United States right now, you can go to almost any pharmacy. Just walk in, get yourself a vaccine. Mm -hmm. If you haven't done it yet, go do it, please. And if, if you're not in the U.S., I don't know what your situation is. Sorry. Good luck. So, next one is um, diversity among certain classes of genes. So this is the created heterozygosity. He says they claim this. Doesn't say anything else. Just yes, we did claim that your your created heterozygosity model is. Terrible. We did say that. So we didn't attempt to refute it. So what they, um, a quick note, what they use to actually support this idea that later they'll be like, huh, they said it was impossible for, you know, uh, be, to be able to get all the modern diversity we see from just a couple. And they cite um, Hoser and Gauger, Hoser and Gauger, rather, from 2019. And Beckley. Um, Wait, oh, did they cite the new one too, the Beckley one from this year? They, they, they mentioned the Beckley one, but it's in the reference to waiting time. Okay, cool. It's this this Hozier and Gauger one is the one where it's specifically talking about could humanity have the genetic diversity that we have having progenated from a single couple, a single contemporaneous couple. And there are a whole lot of problems with that. First and foremost, it was published in Biocomplexity, which is an ID journal. Uh, Second just, no, one, it's not. That's not an ID journal. That is the that is the Discovery Institute blog is what Biocomplexity right, is. Right. Okay, because. I'm it's it's it. all one incestuous yeah. mess where the authors and the editors are all the same people. Okay, it's it's everyone passing around each other's papers to each other, rubber stamping them. It's not biocomplexity. I will go to the mattresses on this one. Biocomplexity is not a journal. It is a blog run by Discovery Institute. It well, pretends to be point. a journal. Yeah, hmm? case in point, there's a typo. Like when it was first published, there was a typo where mortality was spelled morality when talking about the mortality of a given population. So that doesn't happen in, in peer reviewed journals. They also use an insane population growth rate that's way too high, right? It does not work. And any peer reviewed journal would be like, hey, how are you justifying using this high population growth rate? Like that, again, peer review exists for a reason, but <laughs> it gets worse. Because the, the proposal that this that uh, Hozier and Gauger make are they're basically like, okay, we can get two hypotheses that can result in this single contemporaneous pair being the progenitor of all extant population, the entire extant population of humans. And one, you can get it from a single pair, but something would have had to happen to kill off every single other hominin, hominin, okay? So Homo erectus, everything else, and it would have to be 500,000 years ago. Any sooner than 500,000 years ago, and you can't get the diversity. Then they say, okay, but let's say you do created heterozygosity instead. Then you might be able to get it to like 100,000 years ago. And then they say, or even sooner, which is like their little their little cherry grab for the young earth creationists, should they should they like to, to, to latch onto it and, and use and abuse and exploit it. Um, but the funny thing is, that's just invoking a miracle, right? Like, first right. and foremost, it's just saying, okay, we're doing the created heterozygosity, and it's still an old earth, because they and don't it doesn't work, right? Years. It still doesn't work for your 6,000 year time frame. And the most bonkers thing at all, of, of all, rather, is they're not looking at other primates when they're doing these kinds of, um, when they're doing these kinds of, of mutation rates. They're not looking at anything like slowdown. They're not looking at, at contemporaneous rates with, with other extant apes at the time, including other hominins. So if we're pushing it back to 500,000 years, Adam and Eve are Homo erectus. I'm, I'm right. really sorry, but they just are. There's no <laughs> way to get humans like back that far. You can't I get Homo sapiens. It doesn't work. Yeah. Right, exactly. And there's also just no mechanism for, for the de novo one. Like they, they straight up just say, okay, we're doing de novo created heterozygosity and and it's just going to be totally fine no one worry about it 
Uh, so we'll do the next later. I want to plug one, some of your work on this because you've done some really nice work on this exact thing. Because when you say, if you kind of use, you know, established processes to get the diversification, you end up at about 500,000 years. It's not coincidence that that is where you end up using Dr. Joshua Swamidas' mm -hmm. time to most recent four alleles calculations, right? Which assumes a created heterozygosity in Adam and Eve, and then, you know, observed rates of recombination, mutation, right. population growth, on and on and on, right? And so that's that that actually lines up with that idea, which puts Adam and Eve about 500,000 years ago. And then the second part of that, where you're building some more miracles in, um, you can have different ways to up the level of diversity. That basically works out to, to Swaminas's time to most recent 10 alleles because you're still stuck right. at the flood bottleneck and right. the time to most recent 10 allele calculations get you about 180,000 years ago. And that's pretty close to what, what the, the DI people are saying. So it actually, yeah. so what I want to plug is you did a really nice series with Josh on this and you mm -hmm. went through four models of like, you need a miracle here and whatever. And like, it doesn't get enough diversity and it assumes miracles. And you went through mm -hmm. a bunch of different potential models to show how the math actually works. And uh, if you want, just send me that link and I'll put it down in the description yeah. because that is a great piece of work that does, I love it because it's what I like to do. It's like, let's take this model at face and value and mm -hmm. actually do the math and see what happens. And it's just, I wanna, I wanna plug that for everyone. Everyone should check out that writing. Yeah, well, Josh, I mean, Josh did all the work for all of that. Uh, Dr. Swaminas was the one who did the math for it. I just animated it and helped it, try to put it into like a super digestible, uh, you know, wet uh, means, right? But you're right. They run into the same problem that they run into with, with Josh's situation, which is you can, I, you can do one of two things. You can get the diversity you need, but it messes with every piece of paleontologic evidence we have. Adam and Eve are a different kind of hominin, and it takes four ever and thus can't be younger creationists creationism rather get into the younger creationist lens or alternatively you can invoke miracles from square one it's no longer science and there's still not enough time so you still can't get it even if you invoke like your maximum amount of diversity it's still going to be a couple hundred thousand years and, at, the at the very least tens of thousands and by maximum amount of diversity, we mean created germline diversity, where all mm -hmm. of Adam and Eve's gametes are unique from each other. It yep. still doesn't solve the problem. Yep. Yep. Cool. And, and it's very similar. I mean, you and Walker did this one to death in, in your video with him, but it's like, and again, it still doesn't solve your nesting problem. Adam and Eve are going to be African no matter what. You cannot get them to the Middle East. If Dr. Carter deigns to respond to this, which I have a feeling he'll say they're too sassy, they're too mean, I'm not touching it, and and he'll you know espouse that he's taking the high road by not responding. That's fine. Well, I don't. Really that's, care. Fine. that's fine. But if you do deign to respond to this, I would love an answer to that. I would love to hear how it is exactly. And by the way, we're going to touch on it in a minute. Dan and Walker already went through your article on why Africans have so much. All you know, those six things. Yep. They already went over that. I've got it in my notes, so we'll touch on it here. I don't want the reassertion of A. I want an explanation of our critiques of your claims. Why are our critiques incorrect? Yeah. I'm I'm a mere student with a master's degree, and I can say that that that's how peer review works. So I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, let's see. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to jump down for a second. We're just going to keep right on marching here. The next thing he says is the pedigree versus uh, versus substitution rates, the pedigree mutation rates versus substitution rates to do the time to most recent common ancestor calculations. This I love. From work I did a decade ago but never published, I know he's wrong, he being me. From work I did a decade ago but never published, I know he's wrong. Why haven't you published it then? Mm -hmm. That would be a big deal. You should get that peer-reviewed and in the literature because man, if you can show that those substitution rates are wrong, man, that would be a big deal. But here's the thing. I don't think they have the goods, Dr. Carter, yeah. Dr. Jeans, and anybody, because I've looked at all their math, and I actually have a video from uh, not too long ago where I actually used Jeanson's math to make some predictions and compared it to actual mitochondrial data with known divergence times and calculate the actual substitution rates compared to the rates that Jason says we should observe if yep. his math is correct. And it's all wrong. It's not even close. It's off by 
at best like a factor of six to eight and at worst like a factor of like 60 or 70 it's not even in the ballpark it's so wrong so he can say he knows this but like put up or shut up at this point like you gotta like show your word dude this is dan this is the science equivalent i did the work but never published of my girlfriend goes to another school uh, uh, yeah yeah that's that's, that's right. what it is i mean mm-hmm. it, i'm really sorry but that counts for nothing it, you say you have it provide it i'm sure dan who who has a background in in you know population genetics or any evolutionary biologist for that matter would be more than happy to eyeball it i would love to i will do the peer review for free send it i mean peer review is done it's voluntary but like i'll do it without you even having to submit to a journal send it my way i'll give it a look over i'll mark that up and i'll send it back i'll check your math yeah let's do it that would be fun that would be fun as heck or if it's correct great you changed the i'll tell you Awesome. If you if it's correct, I will tell you. Like and what like yeah. So, go for it, dude. I would love to see that math. Okay, we're asking difficult questions, hardest questions, and they know it. Yes, we do. Mm-hmm. Patting, let's pat ourselves on the back. Yes, these are hard questions for creationists to answer because they don't have any answers, as I have learned over the last few years, being repeatedly disappointed by the professionals. And in retrospect, my experience on the debate evolution subreddit was some comparatively high level stuff compared to some of the stuff we find on YouTube from the amateurs and the professionals. And that's disappointing. I wish I could say too, that the reason for this was because um, they're, they're trying to put it into a digestible format for laymen. But like Dan, I own some of the texts that have been published by, by some of these guys. My, my personal favorite, and these two are both name dropped in this article, is Contested Bones by Sanford and Roop. And I happen to have a background in paleoanthropology, and I can tell you that is all wrong as well. It's violent misrepresentation. And I'll be doing a very long Library of Error series on that eventually <laughs> to really outline what's incorrect. But I've already covered some of what they've butchered with Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis in a couple of videos back. So Dr. Carter, by all means, I'll also provide this link for Dan so that, that you can um, see see for yourself where your colleagues have gone wrong on this. Because I had my video and my notes for the video checked by paleontologists, paleontologists rather, I should say. Now we get some, now we get some just egregious being wrong about stuff. They must assume a near constant mutation rate to put a time frame on any event. That's not true. One, it's a substitution rate, not a mutation rate. Those are two different things. Two, you can correlate genetic evidence with paleontological evidence. So you don't need that to, to date things. You can date things based on remains and date those. And that can also help you date like divergence events and migration events. So that's not true. And also it's, it, you need to be able to reasonably detect the substitution rate, but it doesn't need to be constant. And in yep. fact, there's a lot of work on how, because mutations are lost over time, you get a faster rate in the present and an apparent slowdown as you get into the distant past. And I'll, I've plugged this before, but I'll plug Evograd series on uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's work uh, replacing Darwin. As Evograd goes through, he points out this very uh, flaw and he does a really nice job with it, showing how the short-term mutation rates converge to the long-term substitution rates over time. And the challenge is determining the shape of that curve, right? Well, as you're as you're calibrating known events, you want to plot what that curve actually looks like. It's right. not a constant rate. That's what makes it challenging. But we mm-hmm. have evidence that will allow us to determine what it actually looks like. Well, and the more the more data that you're plugging into it, the better the situation gets. Exactly. Um, I, I want to plug two papers: Bessenbacher, 2019, and uh, Chandrapati and uh, Morsani, 2020, who have both done work on grade eight pedigrees, and that includes humans. And the very, very interesting thing that they found in the 2019 paper is that for a while now, there's been a, a slight discrepancy between the molecular clock and uh, the, the paleontologic record, right? There's been a, a skewing. Yep. It turns out that when you actually take into account the pedigree rates for the great apes and you apply this um, very specifically to be more like essentially until you see our your growth rates start to look more like anatomically modern homo sapiens rather than what we see the the development looking like for for the great apes you you see this transition as dan just said so mm-hmm. the just... rate yeah the mutation rate for human evolution to actually match the paleontologic record isn't the hominin isn't the genus homo rate and it's not the great ape rate it's the great ape rate that becomes 
the genus Homo right? Because that's precisely what happened. Yep. And, and, and they this documented is... this using pedigrees like they ask for in, um, in Bessenbacher et al. 2019. There you go. And there's your citation. So the, the last thing I'll say on this before we move on, and I will say, because I see the heading of brief detour here, we are just about done, everybody. So mm -hmm. like to the extent that there has been substance related to the video we did, we're, we're basically there. Okay, like that's that's it. We're almost done. Um, if you're wondering, where do they get to the arguments? Uh, we're, <laughs> we're doing it like this is it. So the last thing I'll say about this is this slowdown where the the closer you are to the present, the faster the apparent rates are because of things like drift and selection and inbreeding, weeding out mutations over time. This is not new. This is well documented. It's well understood. And for people that I mean, we got the whole thing earlier about John Sanford, decades, blah, 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 blah. Like, then why don't you know this stuff? Then like, you know, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen with his Harvard PhD, why don't you know that? Yeah. At, why did you not ask somebody at any point, right? Uh, you know, this is, these are not secret. Nobody's keeping this stuff a secret. You could just like go on, you know, Google Scholar or Sci-Hub or something and just like, and just find papers on the topics that are this and see what the, what's the deal with this mutation rate slowdown instead of straw manning it, but they don't, they just, just go with it. You know, it's, so this last little bit has a lot of fun packed into it. I really, really appreciate what's going on here. So he gives a bunch of things about why stuff would change. Yeah, stuff would change. Mm -hmm. Done. We, we account for that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, but let's look at this changes in the, the uh, DNA repair systems, perhaps associated with a burst that occurred during the flood or due to cosmic rays that would necessarily have occurred during rapid magnetic field reversals. Like, like this is just the plot of 2012, right? The movie, like just call Michael Bay or any what? of the movie guys, because this is just motioning at something that sounds vaguely scientific, calling it a hypothesis. Okay. I, there's, this is bonkers for so many reasons. One, if there is a burst of mutagenizing radiation, what's going to happen to a lot of that population? They're going to die, right? And they're going to get a bunch of mutations real fast. And you know what's cool? We can spot that in mm -hmm. like when we do phylogenetics. We can go like, oh, this is weird. At this point in the past, there were way more mutations. And you could, you could actually determine that, right? So you could look at like migration patterns and know when different, different lineages appeared where on Earth. And then you can see where there are very few differences between lineages and a lot of differences between lineages. And you can date where those lots of differences appeared. So that burst, like, again, let's do our thing and take this seriously. If that was the case, you would see big differences, not at the tips of the trees, right? At the tips of the branches closest to the present, you would see a big burst of variation being added to the human genome way back in the past. So when we did our rate analyses to try to figure out what that curve looks like, there'd be a big bump in that curve at some point yep. in the past. And we would be able to detect that. Like, to, so to pretend this is a serious idea is just unreasonable, right? This is just silly. This is not. It reminds me of in in one of the suggestions in the previous paper, the um, uh, Gauger and Poser and Gauger, they suggest that, that, that there could have been this mysterious event that killed off all other hominins, right? Leaving this single progenitor pair somewhere in some, you know, lost and forgotten gorge to reproduce and, and create all the hominins that, that we see past 500,000 years ago, more recently than then. And, and then this event just evidently left no mark in the geologic record. It didn't touch any other species on this entire planet, just hominins and it didn't leave a single trace of itself in, in anything. I mean, like, the Oklo uh, reactor alone, which Dan and I both love very much, yeah, tells us uh, that there was no cosmic ray burst. There simply wasn't. Unless you want to take the route that some have taken, which is that the flood essentially washed all of that radioactive material in, in a very specific way with all of the <laughs> with all of the bits and pieces and just so to appear as though this has been keeping perfect time along with every other means of corroborating radiometric dating from ice cores to stalactites and stalagmites to uh, the different kinds of radiocarbon dating to dendrochronology uh, to the speed of light, um, thermoluminescence, all that kind of stuff. We could list it all off. We would know 
okay if there had been a cosmic reverse unless of course god is being intentionally um he's obfuscating intentionally he doesn't want us to know that it occurred in which case it's indistinguishable from conventional science so why entertain it right the very last thing here we actually two there are two more things and then i swear we're pretty close to the end here everybody so we've got uh patriarchal drive mess up genetic clocks no because patriarchal drive one assumes miracles because you have the hundreds of years time frames and i should say not just hundreds of years time frame but hundreds of years reproductive time spans right mm -hmm. so you've got biblical patriarchs reproducing at five six seven hundred eight hundred years old right right so that's so one invoking miracles two Carter has a paper on this, and I should do a standalone on this because the way he does it, he comes up with a couple different models of like, here's, and here's what he's saying with patriarchal drive is that as, because human males make sperm throughout their lives, it's one set of tissues in the germline that are doing this. As they replicate, you accumulate mutations over the course of your life. So there are more mutations in the sperm of a 50 year old man compared to a 20 year old man. Right? right, because you just get more mutations accumulating in those germline cells over time as they replicate, and that mutation rate accelerates as mm -hmm. like you know error checking things get errors it's, in them over many 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 cycles. Right, it's a consequence of senescence, is it not? Yeah, it's it's related to exactly right. So as as you age, just you stop doing certain things. Some of it is energetic. Some of it is your shutting down genes. Some of it is mutations occur that are that are preventing you from from fixing some of these mutations so it's not just that uh you accumulate mutations in a linear fashion in within detectable human lifespans it's an accelerating fashion right it's an exponential curve now what carter does is he can't make that work because you 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 know go towards the genetic entry side of things if you let that curve continue you get unviable real fast mm -hmm. right by the time you hit like 80 or 90 years old right it's just wait or 120 whatever it is well before you get the years where the the biblical patriarchs are having kids right so what he does is he comes up with a model where it's exponential until you get to the end of human lifespans and then from so like it's exponential out to like 75 80 years and then it goes linear for the rest of the time why does it do that we literally have no data to justify that. He He's fitting it into the model to make the number of mutations work and the time spans that are required of the patriarchs in the Bible. He's like, in terms of their ages, he's just futzing with it to make it fit with this pre-existing model. It, there's nothing empirical, there's nothing valid about the math he does in that paper. It's just like, what do I, how do I have to cram the numbers to make right. it work for what I want it to work. And that's the model he comes up with. And maybe at some point I'll do a standalone creation myth on patriarchal drive or look at that paper or something. It's just, it's it's one of those things where I go until I find like the first major error and it's like model one, that doesn't work. Model two, that doesn't work. Model three, exponential and then linear. Like this is just, you're just putting stuff together for no reason. Like that's, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't work. I mean, and right after that, he gives his six reasons. And that it's actually in that article that you and, you and Walker went over already that he manages to goof up. And you guys covered this already, like I said, but inbreeding, recombination, and he uses an unrooted tree. And, oh, he does the unrooted tree shenanigans. It's Wonderful. Triple whammy. He does it for the Y chromosome, but it's a triple Same problem. Whammy. Doesn't matter. Same problem. Same problem. So while we're at it, Dr. Carter... In this list of your six reasons, if you feel so inclined, do let us know how that squares with your nesting problem. No matter which of those six things you want to invoke, everyone's still nesting within the African lineages, right? Everybody's still coming from Africa, specifically Central Africa, or East Central Africa. So how how is that squaring? What is your what is your explanation for that? that's that's what that's how this is i think should work and, right that's and just to give what's the response to the critique and just to give people an idea of the problems with his six reasons that they are contradictory with each other like they, they don't so he can say like oh there's you know more recombination within african populations right and that's why you get the the uh linkage disequilibrium right that's wrong for a whole bunch of reasons we don't need to go into it here they say there's more hot spots um, and there are a higher frequency of a certain gene that there, there are hotspots, um, but it doesn't increase the overall rate of recombination. It just distributes it differently throughout the genome. So there's not more recombination. It's wrong. But another thing he says is that you have 
different lineages in Africa that actually are isolated from each other. Well, mm -hmm. if that's the case, you're going to get linkage disequilibrium among right. those different lineages, which is contradictory with the higher recombination, which he uses to explain the higher degree of equilibrium, the better admixture across the continent. He literally, in the same thing, has points that are contradictory with each other. And you can't do that. He does. And then there's also just like blatant gaps in the literature understanding. Like he'll invoke selective sweep. He did with you guys in your guys' mm -hmm. um, coverage of the and uh, the, the selective sweep thing is like pretty much par for the course of what happened with Neanderthals, right? The, the, the genome is what became the dominant selectable genome. Right. And the Neanderthals started, you know, pittering out. And we find traces of them all over our genome. Same thing with Denisovans, right? Same thing with some of our ghost lineages. So if we're having this selective sweep that impact all of Eurasia and none of Africa, was there like a Game of Thrones ice wall preventing anyone from crossing <laughs> over? Going in. I mean, no one, if there's one thing we know about hominins, guys, it's that they will breed with anything that even remotely looks like them. It's true. That's how they roll. We see this constantly in, in, in the genomes of various hominins we've been able to sequence. You're going to tell me that that all the entire continent of Africa still... and all of Eurasia were like, nah, we're going to go ahead and nip that in the bud. We're just going to go ahead and stay complete. That's absurd. And, and and besides all of that, there's nothing to support it. Now, to, to Carter's credit, can... Dr. Carter's credit, he is just proposing these, right? He's, there's a lot of, it could have been this, it could have been that, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And that's fine. But again, if you're going to be overturning the paradigm, the next step is to test those hypotheses. It's to show that it's valid. Right. That you have to be able to do that. I mean, a flat earther can sit around and say, well, you know, the reason that the earth looks around is could be because we're floating in a giant mass of, you know, mist ether that causes it to look globular. Right. Okay. That's a, a, okay. Yeah, you can say whatever you want. That's, that's not scientific. So. Anyway. So that brings us, you, you will be amazed, everybody, because this was supposed to be a response to all the points that Erica and I raised in that other video. You will be, a, you will be shocked to learn that that is it, because he now does a brief detour talking about the, uh, the uh, Josh Swaman. This is where he does the Times Most Recent Four Alleles bit. We're not going to go through this. Uh, I uh, will link in the description. Um, Dr. Swaman has put up a response to this specific part on peaceful science. You can go check it there. I will just say this whole section is just chock full of errors, just misrepresentations and mistakes just over and over and over. There's, it is as bad as the rest of the arguments. It's really, really bad. So we're not going to cover this. It because he's already done it. That's, that's he's, the it's done. The link will be and, in the description. So we're not going to step then, on jump toes here. And then last minute update. Uh, he also takes the time to comment on the video I did with uh, Dapper Dino and TD Lane and David Neff on the waiting time problem, which is a completely different thing. We're not going to get into it tonight because it's not related to the video that Eric and I did. It's just a separate video that I did that he's like, hey, let me cover this too. We're not going to go through it because it's not related, which brings us to the conclusion. So, yes, remember at the top I said, Look at the substance versus the complaining. What's the ratio that we ended up with there in this response? What do we all think? Did we, did we, what do you think, Erica? Did we, did we land on substantive responses to our critiques? I, I'm going to take this moment to, to substantiate our, our, you know, label, but this is like the whiniest thing I've ever read in my life. I, I I don't understand how someone who and and by the way I mean Carter's got it Dr. Carter he has his PhD I'm sure he's a very smart dude seriously I, I like absolutely no irony there no no sass meant which you know leads Dan and I to wonder why are these mistakes being made why was the article so vapid why was the article, you know, it was like eating cotton candy for dinner. There's just nothing to sink your teeth into at all here. He's a scientist. Where's the science? You know, there's a lot of linking to other articles. And, you know, I took the initiative Some myself. Of which and we've talked well. about. Right. We, we went and looked at them. And, you know, oh, my utter surprise when they were a lot of the time 
articles Dan had already covered, or I had mentioned in passing, or concepts that we like literally discussed in the video that instead of addressing it, he just links the article, the concepts of which we explained why they don't work in the video he's supposed to be rebutting. You, you see, it's like this weird tail chasing it, thing going on here. All the while- you, Yeah. Oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, it's what you said at the beginning. It's A, well, A is wrong for all these reasons. No, no, you don't understand. A. Yep. Like, but, doesn't the do same it. time, every time. And, and make no mistake, and this is my opinion, that I, I don't mean to, to say that this is by any means factual, this is what I think. But I don't think that this article was meant to be anything other than a, a, a satiation piece for that emailer. Something to say, here are your answers. We have answered the video. There's no need to worry. Trust me, it's been answered. Okay, yeah. where are the I answers? Think that's right. You know, I, I've created a list and, and, you know, we've mostly talked about it already, but there's just off the top of my head, there's nothing on the Tompkins stuff that we covered. There's nothing on the, the, the massive flub up he did where he first used mutation instead of substitution rate. And then he used the mean mutation rate instead of like looking at the minimums and maximums themselves, realizing oh, that oh, that's the average differences range. between. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. He didn't touch yeah. on that. Um, there was absolutely no discussion of the, the specific predictions that, that evolution makes that, that we harp on so much. Why is this such a foundational piece of biology? Because it's so applicable. He's basically like, yeah, you know, they said evolution makes predictions, whatever. That's not something you can slap and go, you yeah. know? Why make an article like this? What is, why address us? You know, if you're so, gonna call us out in a video or in, a, in an article, at least address what we're saying. So I have one, just one addendum before we call this good, because Erica, that was that was eh, ninety minutes. That was pretty good. Can, you know, that was that was pretty good. So I, I have one addendum for this because, as people know, for both of us, but just I've been trying very specifically to like have conversations with the other side. Right? I've had people at watch. I've had Dr. Michael Behe on twice. I've had Dr. James Carter on. Young Earth, uh, I think he's in microbiology, I think. Um, I've had Sal Cordova on a bunch. I've gone on his channel a bunch. Like, I, I, you know, I seek out these conversations in order to, to have it face-to-face -to, -face to, to um, minimize the likelihood of talking past each other. And if there's a misunderstanding, you can address it in the moment. You could stop and go, wait, what? It, how are you defining that word? I just want to be on mm -hmm. the same page, right? And I think those types of things are really important. Now, so I reached out to Dr. Carter um, and Paul Price and John Sanford when they did the genetic entropy response they included me on. I said, you know, it'd be great to have one of you or all of you on to talk about it. Paul Price answered on behalf of all three of them saying, we're not interested. No, thanks. Okay, fine. So for this one, um, I don't have an email for Dr. Carter. So I sent an email to the just the general creation, uh, CMI, uh, Creation Ministries International email just saying like, hey, just so you know. Would, you know, would love to talk to you. Just if this, if you can get this to Dr. Carter, would love to talk to you. I also commented on, um, I left a comment on the article itself on, um, on CMI's website. And you can see all the comments there on that PDF. You will not see the comment that I left because they're highly moderated. So you submit your comment and then they moderate them and like decide if it's going to appear on the article. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you the comment that I submitted uh, because this is, I think, a notable addendum to to this conversation. So I'm just going to share this, and I'm sharing this because this was meant to be a public comment, right? I left this on the article. So this is the comment I sent. I said, Dr. Carter, I sent an email as well. I don't know if it's going to reach you, but whatever. Just covering my bases. I would love to have you on to talk about this stuff face to face. I feel like we're talking past each other a bit, which is a polite way of saying you didn't mention anything that we actually mentioned, like mm. you didn't talk about our, our actual objections. Um, so, you know, it would be useful, just polite, short, to the point, be nice to have you on, right? Okay. So this is his response. And again, I'm sharing this because I submitted this as a public comment, and rather than put it on and answer it publicly, he sent it to me privately. And like, this was like, don't hide this. You're putting a lot of people on there and some people that are really mean. And Carter actually commented on one of the comments going, see this guy being a jerk? This is what we have to deal with. Right, so they're letting people that are that are 
very unfriendly comment on this piece, um, but they hit my comment. So like, mm, I don't know about that. So he mm. says, not interested in a face-to-face. -face. Hard enough putting stuff down on paper, takes a lot of time. Um, talks a little bit about uh, Haldane's dilemma, which none of this is relevant to anything. It doesn't matter um, because Haldane's dilemma was never a problem in the first place, but we'll just let that slide. Uh, and then he's going to go through, update it, blah, 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 blah. And then the important part is right here. Um, uh, stand by the rest of what I wrote, including Swaminas's attempted rejoinder. So he's doubling down. I'm giving. I'm saying, hey, maybe we're kind of talking past. It. Like I'm trying to give him an out to like not be whiny and like insinuate that we're dishonest. And he's just like doubling straight up, doubling down on on everything else in there. So um, yeah, that's that's where that stands. Um, and I did also, I couldn't respond to that uh, because it's a no reply email that they sent it through, but I submitted, uh, and I subsequently couldn't submit any more comments on CMI. It looks like their comment system is having an issue, but I was able to comment on their Facebook. And I said, just by the way, we're doing this thing tonight. If Dr. Carter wants to be present, because I always like to invite people, if I'm talking about an article I write, courtesy, you just invite the person that wrote the article. I think that's sure. a nice thing to do. So I don't expect to be talking to Dr. Carter anytime soon, but Dr. Carter, if you watch this, I would love to. That would be fantastic. And for an idea of how those conversations go, check out my conversations with Dr. Behe or the other Dr. Carter or Sal Cordova. Uh, and like, you can kind of see how that goes and you can decide if those are mock fests or actual conversations. I'm, I mean, I, I will certainly cop it. This time I was quite a bit meaner than I feel like I went, but, but that's, I, I'm a bit insulted, honestly. I, I'm, I'm having trouble understanding why the two of us were berated for our treatment of genuinely wrong information that is being proposed by a professional using their professional name and moniker. Why, why is it that, that that critique is not valid? Instead of attacking the two of us, calling it a mock fest, whining about everything i i man i'm not whining about it i'm a little insulted by by the response mostly because it was a waste of our time you know well, like, um but you but know we got to do this and this was fun it was yes and and you know i the two of us have thick skin i mean you, you can be quite mean and, I, and look, the thing you, got is, to, you gotta if you're doing this i mean especially we you know we're both from the the trenches over on over on reddit with this i mean you know people are throwing elbows over there if you can't take the heat take a step back, right? Yeah. And you know. it's also often how legitimate peer review can be. If if you treat your argument like it's a piece of you, <laughs> you, can, you don't belong in the ring. That will you be know? a problem. And I don't feel, mm. I'm very interested if, if Dr. Carter does feel the need to respond to this, I'd be very interested in what aspects of our previous video were insulting to him rather than his arguments, other than saying, I'm a little surprised getting this wrong, in which case, Tell me why it isn't wrong, Dr. Carter. Why is it? In, why is it? Why is it correct? Why was was it inaccurate? Were we? Was it libel? I don't know. Um, and we we probably will never know because I don't imagine that we'll get a response to this. Although I would be absolutely delighted. The highlight of my month was getting that first reply. Very fun. That was um, like CMI knows our names. Look at that, right? Yeah, that but was. it's like if. Your 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 PhD, you know, writing articles and, and mixing up what inbreeding does or how recombination works, um, and and I'm wondering, you know, maybe it's because you've never taken criticism. I think I think that is a great place to leave it. That is a nice bow on this whole conversation. I think so. I think we can put it. We can call it right there, Erica. Thank you so much for coming on. Always a delight to have you on. Um, do you have anything exciting coming up in the near future? I think you have something tomorrow, right? I do. Yeah, I've got a pre-recorded library of errors. I recorded it before I went camping this past weekend. So I'm hoping to maybe get the second half recorded. It's on a very long, arduous chapter of, of the book I'm currently going through. So I had to split it into two parts because I was actually it was giving me a headache. I was actually experiencing inflammation because of how long all of <laughs> all of the text was. So I had to take a break, but I, I'll hopefully film the second half uh, here in a bit. Um, and I'm working feverishly on a very long video about my visit to the art encounter in the Creation Museum, uh, which is so going to be excited for that. Yeah, it's so going to be really that. fun. It's actually I'm trying to make it my current opus, like my favorite video so far. So why it's taking so long. So yeah, um, yeah. How about you, Dan? Anything come out? 
Um, you know, I have a couple prospects. I don't have anything scheduled yet. I just this week started the second of two summer classes. So mm -hmm. I'm in, in spending a lot of time streaming mode, but it's for class and not for, you know, YouTube stuff. Right. Um, I do have some tentative things lined up. Um, I know David Neff was hanging. I don't know if he's still here, but we were, we're planning on doing something in the near future. I got a couple other things. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a couple creationists that I'm trying to schedule stuff with. Uh, I think one of them may have ghosted me, um, but, you know, we'll see. I got some emails out. Um, Sal and I are always trying to set stuff up on, his, you know, in his house or over here. So we'll, um, we'll there's Sal stuff coming. Always, and and right. speaking of speaking of classroom streams, I see Dapper Dino in the chat. I do want to get back. I, I've been saying this forever, and I promise it's going to happen. I'm going to get back to the Evolution for Creationist series that I started uh, last year at some point. I'm going to get back to that. Um, it's just that takes a lot more work than doing something like this because I have to like put together what is essentially a short class. So that takes a little bit of a um, little bit of, bit of extra work there. But I will get back to that series at some point. And I'm really looking for. Oh, and you know what I do? I do have a really fun video coming up when I have time sometime in the next couple of weeks. It's going to be a stream. It's going to be me testing out a new lecture on check out these topics, the evolution of altruistic behavior. The evolution of virulence among pathogens and the evolutionary dynamics of cancer within an individual. And I swear to you, those three things all go together in a really cool way. And I, I'm taking parts from different lectures and I'm going to put it together into one hour to 80 minute lecture. And I'm going to test it out right here one night. I'm just going to be like, hey, we're going to, I'm going to teach a class. Let's see how this goes. And I'm really excited to see, to see how that goes. That's going to be a blast. I'm I don't very know when, but I'm going to do it soon. I, yeah, I it's, love it's it. cool. All right. So that is a wrap, everybody. I saw there were like 60 or 70 people here most of the time. So thank you yep. all for being here. I can't tell you how much I appreciate everyone hanging out in the chat and just, just making this super fun uh, and caring about what we're, we're doing. Like and comment if you feel like it. Thank uh, that you. That really helps the algorithm suggest Dan's content. I actually got, uh, I rewatched, again, I was rewatching our video and I got a suggestion on YouTube that was like, how would you rate this video? I was like, five stars. It was like, what was your favorite <laughs> thing about it? I was like, it was a, <laughs> help Thank the you. algorithm. I, I appreciate that. Feed that algorithm, everybody. Yeah. Like, subscribe, share it on Twitter and on whatever social media of choice you have. I always forget to say those things, so thank you for reminding me. And if you're not, if for whatever reason, you are not subscribed to Guts at Gibbon, go over there and fix that right now. The channel yeah, is Guts at Gibbon. Go over there and fix that. You should be subscribed to Erica. If you're not, not, if you're watching me and not, something's wrong. We're trying to shill, you gotta listen. I mean, yeah. and shilling is the best, getting the best shot at this reaching are the illustrious Dr. Rob Carter. Uh, who I would so love to hear from. So love it. Love to talk. <laughs> Dr. Carter, I'll end it with this. Dr. Carter, I would love to have you on. We would have a really fun conversation. And Dan will be nice. He'll be nice. I will be, I will be nice. It will not be a mock fest. Okay, everybody. We've had it. I think we've had quite enough fun for one night. Good night, everybody. Have a great night.